Hey everyone, welcome to American Optimist. Today I'm gonna to introduce you to some close friends. These are not necessarily the people you see on the news, but they're the innovators and thinkers behind a lot of great things going on in our country and excited for you to get to know them. First up is my friend Sal Churi, who runs Trust Ventures. We're going to discuss 3D printing, nuclear reactors, and all sorts of new innovation that's changing the world right now. Sal, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Joe. It's exciting to be here. So, so how did a law professor end up starting a venture fund, and what, what are you up to? Yeah, those sound like two really different jobs, right? Um, <laughs> they're actually a lot more similar than they sound. So my whole career has basically been driven by a singular obsession with the collision points between innovation and regulation, and more specifically, where old laws or laws put in place by incumbents, right? Big companies that wish to see the world stay the same because they benefit from the status quo, uh, and new technology that inherently wants to change the status quo. So a lot of big companies have influence over the law, and they use that to stop new innovations. Right, right. That or laws that are 50 years old and are a bad fit for new technologies, right? So you can, t you can think of all kinds of different examples here, right? So uh, in housing, we did a company, we invested in a company called Icon, 3D printed houses, right? It looks like a tube of toothpaste squirting out uh, concrete, and in 24 hours they can put up a house. So the way we permit housing maybe makes it harder for 24 hour house building. Our, our whole housing permitting structure was built around sticks and bricks. It's the way we've done things for the last thousand years. And all of a sudden there's just radically new technology. What do they do with that, right? The words are on the page and laws don't change themselves. What's an example of a law you have to get changed to make the, make the toothpaste housing work? Yeah, so there's, there's zoning, there is international building and fire code, right? There's things like impervious cover, right? There's local level, there's international level that, that winds up getting adopted. How's the fire code as an example? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't the fire code just say you don't want these things to burn down easily and so as long as they don't burn down, it's fine? Or like, is there specific stuff in the law that, that's stopping them? It would be great if laws were written that way, Joe. That's, what, that's why we all would love for you to be our philosopher king. Um, uh, but I think, unfortunately, they write the law for the thing in front of their face, right? So instead of saying, hey, we really want to prevent fires from spreading, right? Which concrete is great for this. Concrete houses are much more durable, much more dignified, much safer in so many ways. Uh, but instead, they sort of say, well, don't build the timber like that, right? Because it might catch on fire, right? But it, all, the, all those things are, are, are not sort of like built to take account of the way the world will change. Laws are a snapshot. Regulations are a snapshot. Uh, and, and they're often reactive rather than proactive. So if you think about it, the people that we trust to, to make these laws, the lawmakers, the regulators, the, the bureaucrats and their they're, offices. They're, they're probably not focused on innovation as much. They're focused on protecting people and, and covering their asses. Right. Every, every law is, in, in large part, a story about a tragedy that happened, uh, a tragedy that they wish not to see happen again. Yep. And, and it usually is a response to sort of public outcry about something. And so. As a result, you get every lawmaker, to put it in sort of strategic or military terms, fighting the last war. Sure, so we, so we, so we have this whole system of laws that's slowing down innovation, but this is the American optimist. So we're optimistic, we're gonna make things better. Yeah. I, I guess the optimistic take on this is there's all these innovations that could be changing our society for the better that we're gonna start trying to allow by, by fixing these laws. Yeah, so uh, this was the foundation of my work in the academy and, and, and sort of is the, the impetus very much for, for Trust Ventures, for the fund. It's, it's saying, where has technology already solved big intractable problems, but where sort of old regulations sort of haven't allowed it to sort of permeate or proliferate, right, to, to, to use it? I, I know one of the areas you're interested in, obviously, in this regard is nuclear technology. We yeah. had all these submarines all around the world powered by nuclear. We were building all these nuclear power plants. We had some amazing early results and then it, kind of stops and slowed down. What, 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 what happened with history there? Yeah, nuclear is the perfect example here, right? You think of a technology where the, the potential impact is incredible, staggering, right? Um, there's a little known story of a nuclear reactor called Experimental Breeder Reactor 2. So Argonne Labs ran this reactor between the 60s and the 80s. And for that period of time, they intentionally tried to melt the thing down, right? It is, it's what's called a neutron fast reactor design. How do you try to melt something down? Yeah, you overheat it, basically, right? So they pushed you just, it like, to its limit. Shoot it with a laser gun and see what happens. <laughs> the, the physics are, are somewhat beyond you, me. You dynamite it and. In effect, you, raise, you just raise the temperature. You just make it really hot. Yeah, yeah. You, and you, you see you, what happens. Yeah. They, and, and, you, and, they, and they did this in a populated area? Uh, not in a populated area. It was in Idaho, um, in, in a very sparsely populated. Some friends populated, in Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> a sparsely populated uh, part of Idaho uh, at Idaho National Labs. Uh, and what they did was they intentionally tried to melt the thing down uh, to, to basically prove the safety of this passively cooled, it's a liquid metal cool design. 
uh, and they couldn't melt it down. It just shut down, it expanded, and it cycled through. Uh, and so not only did they prove that it was dramatically safer, but maybe more importantly, they, for, they, they ran this thing through the 60s and the 80s, and it put out three cent zero emission energy. And what's, what's, what's three cent mean, like relative to everything else? Yeah, three cents per kilowatt hour means it beats just about every hydrocarbon, right? It's, it, this is basically- so cheaper than natural gas, cheaper than, than oil. Doesn't beat nat gas in the Permian Basin, but pretty much everywhere. Pretty yeah, much everywhere and else. so it, it is. I guess it's less carbon emissions than nat gas in the Permian Basin. Zero carbon emissions, yeah. right? So it is zero emission, right? Which is important, uh, and it's cheaper than almost everything. But more importantly, it's baseload energy, right? So you could be really excited about wind and solar, and that is great when the wind is is sort of blowing. It's and not the sun as is great when the windmills are frozen. Exactly. Here in Texas, we had a we had a run in with some frozen windmills. Uh, could, could, would, the, would this would this have frozen too? I guess it could have if it wasn't. Set up no, it is a closed loop design. Uh, so basically, just about every form of energy is turning some kind of a turbine. Uh, and this is a, a system that is closed loop. So it is completely. Should we, should we talk to the Texas governor about this then? Is this, is this a solution here? I think we should. How, think... how close How close is a company I, you're invest, we're invested in? I think it's called Oclo. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a tiny angel investor there too. You know a lot better than me. How close are they to actually taking this technology and, 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 and putting it back to use again? Yeah. Uh, one insight from working with Oklo on this is that the hardest part of building a nuclear reactor is not building it, it's not the physics, it's getting it permitted. It. Uh, and what they've just done in the past 12 months, they've not only gotten the first ever in history grant of test fuel for a advanced nuclear fission reactor, the first ever uh, site permit for an advanced fission reactor. But most importantly, they got something called a combined license application. I heard the big companies tried to stop them from getting the grant of test fuel because those guys wanted to control it and not let new upstarts get into this area, huh? There are always stories where uh, large incumbents look at you know new potential competitors and say, well, you know, are we sure this is safe? Are we sure this is a good idea? Uh, and and I think you know here with with Oklo. Uh, they have a dramatically better design for a nuclear reactor. Putting a reactor in the ground today is just about impossible. It's a 10-year, $300 million site-built morass, right? And, and that's even taking out the political elements. That's, that's for an old-school light water reactor. Putting an Oklo reactor in the ground is a very different story. So, How big is this thing? They are two megawatt reactors that you can throw on the back of an 18-wheeler. Drive it out to your house. Bingo, right, yeah. So, Are you, you going to have one in your backyard? What, what do these things cost? Soon, soon, hopefully. Uh, the, the, the pricing, so they're, they're actually not even selling the reactors. My friend was trying to convince me to dig a giant hole in my backyard to get geothermal energy. Is this, is this, more, this is more efficient than that, hopefully? We think so. Geothermal has some promise, but there's some, there's some fundamental technological breakthroughs that really need to occur for geothermal to be a reasonable source of baseload energy. And baseload is so important because so much of energy use is baseload, yep. right? It's factories, it's industrials, right? Uh, and, and I think Oklo looks at that and says, wind and solar are great. They're not going to power factories, right? Yep. We, need, we need uptime. We need reliable sources of always on and this energy. This is just always on 24-7 nuclear reactor. How long does one of, these, one of these things last? 20 years. 20 years. And the best part is it takes spent fuel from existing light water reactors out there in the fleet that we don't know what to do with. Uh, that there's this whole debate about, you know, Yucca Mountain is, is a sort of this great example where there was meant to be a political compromise to take all these fuel rods from the existing light water fleet. We didn't know what to do with them. So our brand, brilliant solution was let's drill a big hole in a mountain You somewhere. can actually use this stuff instead now to power a reactor still? So instead of trying to figure out what to do with these light water reactor rods, we take those rods and Oklo breeds them down into much less fissile, much safer fuel rods for these new reactors. Wow. And so we basically are taking these orange peels that are radioactive and squeezing more orange juice out of them, right? We're figuring out ways. Well, what do you do with it after the 20 them. years? After the 20 years, so there is some level of radioactivity. It is dramatically less than where it is when you start. And, and then you put it back in the mountains and, or whatever. So so there, there are other sort of solutions to this, right? Uh, Deep Isolation is a company to take a look at that's, that's kind of figured out a way to use hydraulic fracturing techniques to capsule seal things off and put them deep uh, underground. Put them um, back put them back in, in, the, in the fracking areas, huh? Uh, well, not back into existing sort of frack wells, but to, to basically create places deep underground where we don't have to be as worried about and them. You can try to keep them away from the water table, I would guess? Bingo, bingo. Okay. And they're, they're sealed and, and sort of, there's a fairly well understood way to, to do this. Uh, but when it comes out of the, re the Oklo reactor at the end of 20 years, 
uh, it's only got about a hundred year half-life as opposed to about a hundred thousand year half-life. Oh wow, so you've used up so much of it that the half-life is actually, is, is actually going to be gone. Exactly, because through the process uh, of breeding in the fast reactor, it's burning off a lot of that radioactivity. Right? So they're effectively just more efficiently using this fuel that we very inefficiently have used for the past 50 years. That's fascinating. I, I, saw, I saw a study recently that they found when the Earth was young, uh, uranium was a lot more fissile, so you could actually trace what radioactive uranium did with the Earth's crust. And so it turns out it, it seems like it doesn't travel too much. It is pretty safe, but it's still always a little bit scary, like not knowing exactly what's going to happen with this material. So this is, this is much safer, it sounds like. This is, this is physics that's over the head of a recovering law professor, but uh, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> so Oak is a great example. You guys put some money in, helping it raise huge amounts of money to deploy. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, so are, are there lots of other things like this? Are there lots of other areas where our society could be taking advantage of technology, and that, but we've just screwed it up somehow by mistake because we were afraid or naive? Or like, what, what are other examples? So sometimes there's there's sort of an entrenched player who's actively trying to keep a new a new technology out of market, right? I'll give you one example there. We did an online eye exam company called Visibly. Uh, they can they can increase uh, dramatically increase access to affordable eye care. Yep. So you think about getting an eye exam now, it uh, it costs a lot of money. It it means you got to take time off of work. Uh, and, and it's a huge problem. It's a bigger problem than, than most people in this country are aware of. Worldwide, two and a half billion people need an eye exam and can't get one. And even here in the States, 24% of US counties don't have an optometrist in them. Right? How, how'd, you, how'd you get this to be allowed to be telemedicine? Yeah, so, so what we did was we invested in this company and then we saw these telemedicine laws that were sort of percolating. Uh, and they said something like, telemedicine's great for everything except the following three categories. So obviously some ophthalmology lobby had put this in place to try to stop it. Bingo, right? You, you could see the interest groups. You could see their fingerprints on these bills. It was like, telehealth's great for everything except opioids, okay, abortion drugs, right, political football, eye exams. Huh. Like which one of these is not like, like the others, right? Uh, and so we were, we were able to bring together coalitions of rural health advocates, inner city health advocates, the people who were actually affected by this. Right? All those people that live in those 24% of U.S. counties that have to drive a county or two over to get their eyes checked. We, right? might, we might have had overlap on this. One of, one of our companies, Digital Diagnostics, does uh, diabetic retinopathy. So you can see basically, if you have diabetes, you can start to go blind. Yeah. And, there's, and, there's a, and we had some of the very first FDA approved AI algorithms, but the, but the doctor's groups had changed it, so the AI couldn't be paid anything. So there's no business model to get it out there. Yeah. So all these people in rural areas, there's no doctors to check they might go blind and they're not allowed to use the AI. Yeah. So, so it sounds, sounds like some, probably that company and what you were doing are both pushing towards making this stuff legal for everyone. Absolutely. They're, they're, basically, they're finding better ways to deliver care, to increase access, to lower costs. That's These great. are no-brainers. And sometimes, right, as in the case of the American Optometric Association, they're just actively pushing to keep these things out of market because having lower access to eye care means they get paid they more for eye exam. Right? On the other hand, you have other things where old laws are a bad fit. So this is things like 3D printed houses, right? Or you think of... Um, even the example of nuclear, right, where we had this technology in, in the 60s, right, and this is what kills you. This is, a, this is a solved problem from a technological perspective. The physics here isn't even actually that interesting. It's about getting regulatory approval. Oaklo just got it, which was, was this pivotal kind of world-changing event. Why are people event. talking about it more? It seems like a pivotal changing event, but the news is kind of ignoring it. Yeah, I think you have to kind of force them to, right? And I think, I think many, many times people's um, priors are... To fo we should be focusing on intractable problems so that we can solve them. But instead, I think we focus on the intractability. So fast forward to 2050, 30 years from now, uh, where are we as a society? What's, what, what's, what's gonna be different? I think that's very much in our hands, right? It's, it'll depend in many ways on, on whether we are allowed to move forward. If, and we, whether, do, if we do this right and, and, we, and we fix the laws that are blocking things, th then where are we? If we do it right, we're, you know, we're gonna be taking your Joby flying, flying cars from, uh, from our, our houses 50 miles away and commuting into town, or, uh, and, and all of our energy is gonna be you know, sourced by zero emission reactors. Elon, e and Elon thinks it's more going to be the tunnels and the flying cars will be the exception, but it'll be one of them at least. Who knows? Maybe we won't even leave our houses, right? Um, <laughs> so I think... That's a, little, that's, a, that's a little bit dystopian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, we got really good at this this but, year. But you think you think you make housing affordable for everyone? It's not going to be an issue anymore because it's going to be so cheap to build it. You think energy is going to be virtually free and, and not going to be emitting any carbon, so we're not going to have to talk about climate change as much yeah. in 30 years. It's just going to be an obvious shift. And like, what are, what are like healthcare, I guess, is a big thing. You can make that a lot cheaper if we get this right. Yeah, dramatically lowering the cost of healthcare, increasing the access of healthcare through things like telemedicine, through, you know, examples like, um, you know, 
can we use self-insured models and, and roll those out uh, where we can control costs and more intelligently um, apportion benefits, right? Can we get, you know. Yeah, yeah if, you al if you align the payer and the provider in the right way. Where exactly. People actually have an incentive to lower the cost. Yeah, it seems to me this whole battle about like how much we should pay for healthcare and who should pay for it is just totally mistaken. Like the main thing should be like, can we make it efficient enough and affordable enough that it's easy for society to cover the cost and, to, and then to use markets to, to innovate? Can we improve health outcomes, right? Can we, can we make people healthier? Um, I think you know a pay provider model like what you lay out is so, is a better way to do that. So so what are what are before we close? What are a couple of the other areas you're most excited about that you're looking into right now? What else what else should we be expecting to see you guys working on? Yeah, we touch a lot of things. Everything from helping to you know safely eradicate mosquitoes that can that can cause uh, that can cause dramatic spread of diseases. Were there were there laws blocking that? Uh, you'd be surprised, right? Like the, the question is like, will it be treated as a pesticide? So we're invested in a company called Diptera. Uh, and what they use is a sex selection technique for, for mosquitoes. Turns out male mosquitoes are your friends. They, uh, they don't bite you. Yeah. Uh, it's just the female mosquitoes that do. And female mosquitoes only breed once. And so uh, if you can find a way to sterilize the males uh, and, and- Without sterilizing the people in the area as well. <laughs> Bingo, bingo, right. Uh, they use an irradiation technique that, that doesn't uh, kind of transfer to people. Uh, but what it does do is when these female mosquitoes ma mate with these male mosquitoes, it causes them not to, to be able to reproduce. So you want to be really sure about these things, then you want to fix regulation. And exactly, that's exactly. Well, and, and, and sort of, you know, was, was the law, you know, was, was the regulation or the law designed to prevent people from dumping pesticides into the water the same as this, this technique, which is dramatically safer, right? And so I think we, we always lean on, you know, we're not, we're not engaged in science projects, right? We want something where the science is fairly settled. And you know, science is settled, it's clearly better for the world, yeah. and now how can we help push this forward by fixing the regulations? Exactly. I love it. Next up is my friend Carrie Finley. She's a true innovator in finance, one of the great minds in the credit world. She's going to talk to us about how financial innovation is improving our country. And we're going to go over a lot of interesting con concepts. We're going to discuss why, for example, the US dollar may not be the reserve currency in 2050. I'm excited here today to have my friend Carrie Finley. Carrie is one of the great innovative minds in global finance. She advises a lot of CEOs behind the scenes who are doing things to change how the financial industry works and uh, how it serves our society. Carrie, thanks for joining us. Of course, thank you for having me. Why should people in the general public care about finance? So it's like, so that you're, you're, doing, you're investing in all these things. This sounds like something banks used to do a lot more of, and now there's other people that are doing them other than just banks. And what, what's, what's changing here and why does it matter? I actually think that technology finding its way into financial services is actually taking down costs for consumers. So if you think about the average American who used to overdraft many times a month and pay, I think, 15 to $25 every time they overdrafted, as in addition to interest and return check fees, now you have a couple dollar a month subscription for a company called Dave that provides insurance that allows you to overdraft as much as you need and they obviously have some limits, but for the inadvertent $20, $30 overdraft, they'll ensure for your small payment that you don't get any of those fees and you don't have the interest payments with the banks. So there's lots of examples where these new technologies are just saving a lot of people a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, think about Chime. You know, I, I had a checking account that I was planning on closing just a few weeks ago. And I, you know, I didn't take 100% of the money out because I didn't want you know, in case I had a check pending or something, I didn't want to overdraft. But there were all these low balance fees for having under a certain amount of money in my account. If I use Chime, which is another financial technology company, I wouldn't have that. So it's taking a lot of the fees, a lot of the, call it, you know, aggressive profits that the banks were really going, out, going after out of the ecosystem. Got it. So saving consumers money. What 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 else is happening? Is it's fast forward, maybe more to, more to high level in finance. Like what's what are we going to see that's going to just going to change the world the next 20, 30 years? You know, I think you're going to see a different banking model. I think you're going to see different banks to serve different consumers. You know, right now you have every bank going after the high end consumer, going after the consumer who needs to take out loans. I think you're going to see more specialty platforms that service different consumers in different ways and have, you know, the focus, like Carvana is a great example. Carvana is another financial technology slash uh, car auto technology company that is, is serving the subprime 
consumer, the mid-prime consumer, the person who maybe didn't always have the best credit, and they're doing it in a really sustainable way that I think will lead to a sustainable business. And so I think you're going to find different targeted financial services companies in different parts of the universe that are really going to help uh, take a lot of the fees and some of the excess that consumers have to pay out of the system, which at the end of the month, which month leaves dollars in that consumer's pockets that they can either save, invest, or do other things with. See, small companies make money. The, the, the big banks are able to kind of take less money from, from people overall. So it's, like, it's, it's, it's a redistribution to consumers. Yeah, that's the hope. And, and stepping back a little bit, maybe at a high level, a lot of people are very concerned about the U.S. financial system right now. Um, we're printing a lot of money. We're in a lot of debt. Some people say it doesn't matter. Uh, some people say that the U.S. dollar is not going to be a, the reserve currency anymore in the future. Where are we going with that? Is the U.S. dollar going to be the reserve currency in 2050? It's my opinion that it won't. You know, I think we've done a lot of damage to our economy. And, you know, the problem is that if you look back to the financial crisis, the great financial crisis of 2008, we were saving a lot of money up until those years. I remember in the mid to late 90s, I think we even balanced the budget. Obviously, that didn't come to fruition. And running some debt is obviously okay. We just don't know what the tipping point is. And, you know, I don't know if we're there. I don't think we'll see for a while. But, you know, I certainly haven't bought anything that I believe is the same price or cheaper than what I paid for it a couple of years ago. And so, you know, I think that it's really going to be interesting to see where prices go. I mean, I've been very surprised that inflation hasn't ticked higher. How does, how does cryptocurrency tie into this? There's been some discussion recently that, you know, that is China backing Bitcoin to to go against the dollar is one thing that Peter suggested a little while ago. What are, what, 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 what does crypto do in this? I mean, crypto is like a much kind of better gold, right? So you always hear about gold bugs. Um, if I remember correctly, David Einhorn, who's a prolific investor, was a big gold bug. I, I, I own some gold. It seems like a safe thing to own. It does. But for someone like me, you have to own it. You have to store it. You have to pay to store it. I don't want to have gold bars in my house. The you government don't, you can don't always take go, it. You don't want to go swimming in them. Nope. <laughs> and the government can also take them from you. I mean, I don't know if you go back to the old days. It is in, you know, it's in well, the, the 1930s. Right. FDR yeah. went and took them took all, all away. The gold. So the, I think there's like only one place in America. Biden where, does want to be the new FDR. Some people say. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that as well. I think there's only one place in America that you can store your gold without fear of the government taking it, and I believe it's in the HSBC building on like 42nd, maybe it's 40, 40th and Fifth Ave in New York in their basement, and so. But even still, like it's like a Catholic church in the old days, yeah. where the where the I think your your <laughs> sanctuary is a special gold sanctuary. Yeah, it There's is. There's like crosses all, all around it. <laughs> but you know, so I pay to store my gold. I don't have a lot, but I have a little bit. But with Bitcoin, I have in theory a store of value, depending if others believe it. You is. just carry it on you easily with yeah. a little 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 drive. Or I have it digitally. Or a piece of paper where you write down the numbers. Or I have it in an account at Coinbase, and I pay a lot less for that than I do. Coinbase for might be able to seize it though, wouldn't they? Or no? Well, but you, I don't know how they would seize Bitcoin, because they can't. They don't seize your dollars, but they can seize your gold, and so. I don't know where Bitcoin falls on it, but I think it's a lot Could, less Couldn't they say, we decided that this is competitive with the dollar and it's causing problems, and we're going to do 30% uh, of your tax on it, and Coinbase, if you don't do this, you're all going to jail. And then, they could do that. That would be very unpopular, but they could do that. And then you'd have to have it on your drive, if another for them not to catch you, because then they wouldn't know who owned it. Yes. This is why you know Elon said on Twitter the other time that people should, should have their own keys, basically, just in case. Yeah. So, they, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the real crypto bugs, as I just equate them to gold bugs, probably do that. Um, the rest of us probably not as smart, but um, you're not you're not as worried that they're coming for you yet. Not at least today. I mean, you'll have a lot of uh, maybe if AOC wins the next presidential election, then you'll then you'll go back and you'll download your crypto onto your. Yeah, onto your I would. Drive. That would not be my favorite outcome. Yes. Yes. That's that's fair. And. Uh, and so, 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 what, so what do all these trends mean for decentralized finance in general? What, what is decentralized finance? Is that something that you think about a lot? Actually, I mean, not really. It's something that, like, I've started to look at new protocols. Like, you know, Filecoin's been a very interesting thing that I don't really yep. understand. Um, like, why is computer storage getting so expensive? It's all tra being traded on a coin. But I've seen a couple really interesting protocols where, like, I can make 9, 10, 11% of my money lending out Ethereum. Um, so decentralized finance 
I got, I honestly let smarter people. If, if, and, but, but if people are willing to pay you a really high interest rate on decentralized finance, then it becomes interesting. Yes. Yeah, right. Should people be looking into that right now? That seems like maybe not too many people, then your rates will go down. Exactly. Okay. If they're lending well, it no, out, no I No looking into that. That's that. Carrie's deal, not yours. <laughs> maybe just step back a little bit on the optimistic side. Uh, what do you think are some of humanity's greatest problems on a civilizational scale that people are actually working to solve? Are, are there things tied to finance? Are there things tied to other ones that you're inspired by that people are working on right now? We have a lot of people living in poverty in this country, and I think that's the most important thing to solve. And I do think some of the technologies we were talking about earlier do help them. Like, like, um, like ISAs, which is the Well, that's training. one, but like Chime. I mean, if you... Just like not letting them be abused by the financial system, yeah. protecting them, helping them navigate it. Yeah, if every month your bank account is at zero, that extra $20 is the difference between solvency and not. It's a difference between being able to buy your child new clothes. It's a difference between That's being able so you, to so eat. So you think the financial system has actually really failed a lot of poor people? Absolutely. I mean, you get someone on a credit card spiral, and even if they make their payment every month, they're still paying in the, at least the high teens on credit card debt. I like this. This is like an optimistic version of rather than... Rather than have some like top-down rules to fix the financial system, which is pretty hard to do, and they're going to get around them, we actually can build technology companies to be on the good guy side and to yeah. go, help, go help poor people. And actually use technology to evaluate their credit and use alternative methods and get younger people, which to me is one of the worst things when younger people are in debt. Well, we got, we got, well, we got to teach them about this, right, too. Is, yeah. there, is there a cultural thing where you're teaching, or, or like, is there a nonprofit angle to this, or how, how would we approach it? I mean, I think, you know, having people in the colleges actually teach kids what, um, or, or, I guess. Or in high school, right? Yeah. My, we, we have a, I, I give money to a nonprofit called Foolproof, which tries to teach kids in high school how to be skeptical of financial marketing, because a lot of poor kids, like, will right away get really excited about credit cards and other things they don't know, that, and I to teach them how they're actually being tricked and taught to spend like, what they shouldn't be spending, maybe. Yeah, I mean, my parents always talked about this class they had in high school called Home Economics. We never had that. That's true. We kind of got rid of all the useful ones. Yeah. I mean, people should, like, having younger kids have an app to be able to help them with their taxes, I think that is really important. Being able to get out of credit card debt and, you know, when you're 25 years old, all you want to do is go out, buy things, and look like a bigger deal than Except you can probably Except for you, your afford. boss had to make you do it. Yes, he did. That was very true. <laughs> I, that was, his spending was never my, uh, was never my thing, but... But you're just fasting, you work with money all the time, and you, yeah. and you, and you love credit and finance and fixing things with it, but you're not really interested in spending money. I'd prefer, like, I'll never forget, I got my first, like, decent size bonus, and uh, my good girlfriend was like, let's go shopping. <laughs> and we went to the YSL store, and uh, which is Yves Saint Laurent, and we're in the store, and the saleswoman is showing me this bag, and it's like at least $1,000, maybe two. And uh, it was like the first time I really had, you know, any like real money. You could afford I could the make bag, very clearly. Yeah. I could afford the bag. And I'll never forget, the saleswoman goes, this bag is a great investment. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> a great investment would be if I went home and took this $2,000 and bought a stock or a bond or something else. Thank you. I'm not going to get the bag. I Aww. walked out of the store. <laughs> and that was the last time I've really been in an expensive store because it's obviously just, I just, I look at like. They're tricking other people into thinking they're good investments. Yeah. But you, you'll, tell, you'll, you'll teach them that's not very high yield right exactly. there. So I'd, and I went and I actually bought a stock and I was like, okay, I feel much you, better you about this. You feel better this. about yourself yeah. going home uh -huh. and buying the stock versus buying the bag. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. We'll have to talk to my wife Taylor later about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's pretty good at these things. Awesome. Carrie, thanks so much for, for joining today. It's really, really fun to chat. Thank you. We're also going to talk to my friend Wesley Chan. Wes is a brilliant engineer turned venture capitalist. He's backed a huge number of the most successful Silicon Valley companies. He's going to talk to us about his investing and about some of the early days at Google. Wes, you, you got to Silicon Valley kind of right at the tail end of the dot-com crash, I believe, and you, you ended up being a really important early innovator at Google. How'd, how'd you end up at Google? Oh, boy. It was really funny. I, uh, I got a job at HP Labs, which was fantastic. It was back then in early 2000, uh, one of the most prestigious sort of uh, corporate labs. Uh, and, you know, I think HP was going through its transition. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks at HP Labs wound up uh, leaving at that point. And, uh, Why were they leaving? What was the transition for I think, HP? I think that HP had merged with Compaq and, you know, had deprioritized sort of uh, lab, lab research and corporate innovation, despite um, HP being this fantastic place that invented things like the inkjet printing, uh, invented quantum computing. It was one of the great innovators for many yeah, decades. Yeah, so that's kind of the tail end of their innovation. Yeah, it was the tail years. end of that. Uh, and it was a wonderful thing to sort of be 
you know, sort of watching that that innovation, but you know, it, it, because it's a tail end in, in a in a dot com crash when when companies are deprioritizing that and focused on the bottom line, you know, research and, and those type of areas are the first to go. And so, you know, I was watching this, the Valley implode and guess what? There was one company hiring. It's kind of what I say and what, what I tell founders today that in a, uh, in a, the, the, the one uh, sort of positive upside from any, any type of disaster scenario, whether it be a pandemic or a recession or anything else, is that the winners become completely clear. Were, were a lot of people were more pessimistic at that time because the dot-com boom obviously crashing? Was it, was it HP kind of lost its interest in this or just that they had to for, the, for monetary, monetary reasons? You know, I, 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 was, I was, it was way above my pay grade at that point. And, you know, being fresh out of MIT and sort of like going, oh, I got this great job at HP and going like, oh, this is not the place, you know, I think people are happy. And, uh, you know, but you have to look at the context of that time when, you know, I, I went through f six roommates in less than in less than three months because wow. I, uh, I just kept uh, watching them having to pack up everything in a U-Haul, move back to Ohio or wherever they were from to, to move in with their family, which was just really sad at that point because, you know, all the stars were imploding and I just would have to keep posting. You know, I was in a two bedroom apartment in Palo Alto then and I kept having to post messages on Craigslist going like, hey, you know, I was uh, if you're if you're looking for a cheap room, I got one for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think a bunch of people like Alan Eustace and whatnot had, uh, who was the head of uh, Compact Lab, had just migrated to Google. And, you know, I was, he's like, come join this place. And it was just one of these little interesting places where I was like, I could never see myself in a search company. But So was, he and others brought you along and at the time it was a search company. Which yeah, it was a search company. Showing. And, uh, you know, everybody was trying to figure out what the heck was happening there. But it was the only one hiring at that point. So, you know, like I said, winners become very clear in, a, in disasters. So you, you ended up, I know, working with the leaders of Google. How, how did that happen? Um, you know, it's just a small enough company that it was just really fantastic to be able to be at a place where it seemed like a family, everybody would eat dinner together or lunch together in the same sort of like small cafeteria. Uh, you know, you, you'd show up there and you'd be like tasked on the seven projects at once because there were, you know, as Larry sort of said, there was just way too much to do and too few people. And so the opportunity was just endless. You know, my first job there was to, to help sort of product manage, uh, you know, what was called the Google client team, uh, which became Google Chrome. Like it was the team that, you know, helped, uh, build Google Chrome and you know back then it was Google Toolbar and it was Google uh, it was this uh, this fast search for Google that would predict uh, you know what you would type into your keyboard and sort of uh, preload the searches on your client um, and it was all these pieces that eventually became you know Google Chrome but it was one of these things where he's like you're in charge of this now because like you know it's somebody else's side project and we want you to spend some time on it and by the way like we'd like you to spend some time writing the ad system and I was like huh that's a lot of random things the ad on. system was totally separate project than Google Chrome they wanted you to yeah 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 those. you'd have like five you know today it's just so funny were there like 10 people people at the company? How many people were at the company? I mean, there weren't many product managers, right? Like I shared an <laughs> office with Marissa Meyer and Salar. It was just one of these funny things where, you know, there wasn't many people there. Um, you know, it's just so funny watching Google today. Like if you're a, uh, you know, a senior product manager joining, you might manage one small piece of like, you know, Google Chrome yeah, or yeah, something a tiny else. Piece of and like there thing. I had seven projects, right? I was like, oh, we just need people thinking about this because there aren't enough people. So it was just way more fun than 20 years ago. There was a lot more chaos, which is, you know, uh, the fun part of being at a place where you're just like, huh, this is sort of uh, an interesting place. It depends on your personality. For you and me, it'd be a lot yeah, more fun. Yeah, For fun. some people, it might yeah. be a little... Yeah, honest. a little crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, you know, they hired people that like were, were used to dealing with crazy. So I, I, I couldn't complain about being uh, part of that first What'd you, What did you learn from the founders there? What did you learn from the team? Um, that, you know, I was never thinking big enough. One of my favorite stories was I remember I was uh, helping uh, my friend Brian Rakowski, who uh, was, you know, this... I had first job out of school out of Stanford and he was given, you know, Gmail. That was his project was to help Gmail out. And I remember sitting on the, the product review with him because I was helping him out at that point. And I remember the Gmail team saying, oh, maybe we should like, um, maybe we should give people 10 times what uh, they're being given today on Hotmail. Because remember back in those days, Hotmail was the dominant email service yeah. and so was Yahoo Mail. And they had 25 megabytes of storage. And you would sit there and go like, wow, it's you know, not a lot. But you know, back then it was the state of the art that you would get 25, mail, uh, 25 megabytes of cloud storage and I remember the Gmail team sort of, you know, pitching an early version of this to, to Larry going like, you know, we think we can do 10 times and do 250 megabytes, which sounded like, you know, a lot back then, right? You know, you're getting, you're getting a quarter of a gig. And Larry kind of sat there and was like, why are you wasting your time on like a 10x improvement? That doesn't sound very much. And everybody's like, well, that's a lot. You're getting 10x? He's like, when he starts thinking, you know, sort of calculating on this thing, it's like, what do we give everybody two gigabytes? And I remember the whole team sitting there going like, that's impossible. We'll bankrupt the company right away. There's not enough hard drives to handle like, you know, you know, 10 million users at two gigabytes. And Larry was like, you guys aren't thinking big enough. First of all, like we can do things to help help make sure that, you know, first of all, not everybody's gonna use two gigabytes at once, right? You're like calculating it like an engineer rather than a product manager. You should like learn that, like not everybody's gonna use that at once. You can put caps on it so people aren't uploading MP3s or like, you know, their, their crazy video files or their pornography onto it. Like, 
you know, you want to give people something that they want, but you don't have to necessarily deliver on it right away up front on the day of launch. You just can like sort of ease people into it. At, by the point people are going to be using two gigabytes of storage uh, or even more than that, like, you know, the Moore's Law will have caught up and, you know, you'll be able to deliver on that promise. You just need to be able to, you know, tell people that for those that are the top users, accommodate their needs. And it was just one of these like mind blowing things that like, you know, in, in early like 2001 or 2002, when, you know, people were coming with Gmail that like you could give people two gigabytes. It was completely like mind breaking, uh, mind blowing that like that was even possible. And like it was one of those things where you sat there and go like, boy, I am not thinking big enough. Um, every time, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about something to build or, 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 or launch. And, you know, if you look at how GMO was launched, it got so popular that it had to go on invite only mode. Some of these invites, I remember, were selling for one or two thousand dollars off eBay um, for people to get on their Gmail service because they wanted their two gigabytes of like email. Right. Like it was mind blowing. And then a the search and then everything else was fast. But it was just one of these things where where, you know, he just pushed everybody to. Was think. there a sense when you were building it like this is going to be the number one email provider in the world and there's a really good chance it will be or it might be or like what, what was the energy around that? I mean, it was just, everybody just wanted to go build the best thing that they could build for themselves, right? And then, you know, by definition, if they built it great for themselves, it would be it would be one of, one of the things that would be good for the world. So I think, you know, we first and foremost wanted to build something that we would be proud of sort of using ourselves. And I think that's one of those things at Google where where you would look at this and go, well, you know, uh, what could I build that would be some mind-blowing for me? And if I could do that, I could do that for the rest of the world. You've ended up investing in, in, a, in a very large number of successful companies. T t I mean, t t tell, us, tell us a couple of those stories. What, what, what were some of your early wins that you had? Uh, boy, you know, uh, I'll probably tell you my favorite, which is this fantastic company with this very humble founder uh, in Australia, Melanie, uh, who started Canva. And Canva is today is uh, YouTube for design. They're the reinvention of design. You know, every school student uh, is using it for their homework. And it's one of these things where I've never seen such incredible traction, incredible growth, and such a commitment to reinventing how people build beautiful things and make design simple. And so, you know, I think it's one of the most valuable uh, companies run by a woman entrepreneur uh, that's private today, and you know I think it's one of the fastest growing private companies uh, on the planet. They're based out of Sydney, but it's one of these companies where you know we were privileged enough to find Melanie and Cliff, her, her co-founder, uh, and uh, lead their Series A. And it's been this amazing journey to sort of watch them, uh, you know, build you know the next generation tools for building you know beautiful things, uh, whether it's business cards, websites, presentations. It's the it's a it's a tool that basically democratizes design for everybody. I remember you told me you went and you were impressed by by the whole team and the dynamic of the team as well. That's 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 a part of it for you. It's the founders and it's their team too. Yeah, it's the closest to Google's early days that I've seen. Right, like it's you know they eat they eat lunch and dinner together. There's a chef at the company. I mean, those are superficial things, but it just kind of shows you the commitment to to investing in their employee base and investing in in, in you know. Uh, the, the creativity of their of their of their employees to sort of say we care about what you truly think and in their decision process and sort of having employees come up with their best features and like sort of you know use the tool religiously um, that was something that you know I experienced at Google early on and sort of also saw at Canva and you know before they had turned on any of their recurring revenue it was one of these things where we took that bet and sort of said we we will back you and a lot of people in Silicon Valley said like this is not what we what we do so 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 Canva's in Australia Google obviously and a lot of other companies are in Silicon Valley and near Palo Alto. Uh, you're currently during COVID living in, in Jackson Hole. W where are the next big companies going to be built? Like, w you know, w where should we be spending our time? I think we should be spending our time on the internet, right? Because you know, these companies can be anywhere. And the beautiful thing about COVID, I mean, not that it's beautiful at all. It's a you know tragedy on the pandemic. But one of the benefits of, of the pandemic is it's made remote work, you know, sort of easy for lots of people. It's become much more accepted. We've accelerated the adoption of all the tools for remote working, you know, probably by five or ten years. And so, you know, you're going to see companies formed that are remote in nature or at least where, where the advantage of the founder, even though they might have an office somewhere, will allow them to have a worldwide workforce. And I think you know, that's one of those things where, where I'm spending time trying to think about you know, who those founders are and where they might be and make sure that you know, we're, we're open for business and that like, you know, we're, 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 we're very, very excited about investing in those opportunities where you know, they have a competitive advantage over the people who are still welded to the thing where, uh, that they have to have an office somewhere and that's the only way of working. So, 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 so you're, helping, you're helping nurture and build you know, helping entrepreneurs with all these companies all over the world. You were present at the kind of the beginning of big tech in a lot of ways. Like, like there's been a lot of criticism of big tech lately from the left, from the right, from, from all over the place. Are, are, the, are some of these critiques valid and what should, what should we be doing differently in tech this decade? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many unintended consequences that, you know, were not obvious. Uh, you know, I helped build the ad system and, you know, it was not obvious that the ad system would be feeling you know, some of these business models that are, you know, designed on, on generating clickbait and, uh, you know, sort of you know, having sensational headlines. It makes right? the media a lot more polarizing. Oh, yeah. it's terrible. Um, you know, I, and, and it's one of these things where you sit there and you go, am I responsible? Am I not responsible? Could you That's have done anything differently, though? 
I mean, like we had an ad system, right? Like, but you know, that's, that's a tool. It's kind of like, you know, I don't want to use this example of dynamite of an Alfred Nobel, but like, you know, he was wonderful for, for, you know, construction, for like building tunnels. So dynamite needed to be created, but it also, he also, yeah, but also he had these unintended consequences yeah. where it became a weapon. Right. And you sort of sit there and go like, well, you know, I'm, you know, I, I hope I didn't kill anyone with, with, uh, with an ad system. But at the end of the day, you know, you sort of, you know, think through some of those consequences of, you know, enabling some business models or like enabling people to use that for, you know, negative purposes. And you have to you have to just sort of be cognizant that you know you want to make sure you, in future things that you work on that you can mitigate some of those those unintended consequences. Right, is, there, is, there, is this just something though that was like supposed to exist at some point and someone was going to do it? Such such a powerful model that if Google hadn't figured it out, somebody else would have figured it out in the next five I mean, or ten years. I mean, it's kind of like AI, right? Like I'm an investor in several AI companies, and you know there's a there's a change coming where it will disrupt a lot of people with jobs. You know those are you know I don't want to use the word unintended, but there are consequences that will happen. I think there 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 are things that you know a lot of us are are getting in front of, but how do you mitigate that? How do you mitigate still cha skill change? How do you enable uh, enable business models or new jobs or like retraining that like doesn't leave a lot of people we've, behind? We, we've, we've talked a lot about this. I, I tend to be very optimistic that overall a AI will, will, there'll be new jobs for people overall and it'll be so much more wealth created that everyone will have a much better life even though it replaces some labor. Is that generally your framework as well? Are you, are you more I, concerned? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not going to stop me from investing in companies using AI, uh, but you know, it also makes me more cognizant that there will be consequences and that we should get ahead of it, right? Some of it are the ethical issues where, you know, the, some of the decision factors in AI might affect, you know, certain communities disproportionately and negatively, right? So how do you get ahead of that? You know, another one, uh, one of my theses is, is that, you know, job retraining will be very important as some of, the, you know, these, these, these skill sets get disrupted by AI. So, you know, one of the companies we led uh, and it's one of our top performing companies is this fantastic a company called Guild Education, which helps um, which helps uh, turn college education, and college degrees as a free or very low cost employee benefit. Uh, you know, uh, Rachel, who is the the founder and based in Denver, you know, helped Walmart sort of launch its dollar a day free college degrees for for is in are these are these base. skills based degrees or what, what are they teaching? They're, they're they're actually full college degrees, bachelor degrees that you can obtain, uh, but they're in pretty much any. In any major that you want, and they do teach you know job skills so that you know you can uh, you know get a job at Walmart and then leave after four years and have a degree in communications and it's engineering, in 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 in, in law whatever you know you want to go and reskill yourself to. And one of the insights that she's come up with is that you know we can structure it in such a way that no student ever has to take it alone to pay for this, right? In fact, it's fully paid for as an employee benefit. She's done it with Disney. She's done it with Walmart. There are tens of thousands of students, and it's still early days, but tens of thousands of students taking advantage of this employee benefit and reskilling themselves so that, you know, again, they, they, they don't get left behind in an economy where some of these some of these jobs may not necessarily be there, you know, in, in the future. That's awesome. So let's say there's a smart young young kid listening, maybe someone just out of school, maybe someone deciding what to study in school. There's so many ways you can be part of this ecosystem. There's so much to do. What, what would you want someone who's, who's, who's learning from your experience to, to, to get? Like, what should they be doing if they want to be part of the solution in our, in our society? Uh, you know, I, I think it's just to think big, right? You know, it's easy. It's hard, it's hard to say that, especially when when things aren't going well, or you 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 know you you're in that unlucky sort of part where where you know you're you know you're fighting to survive. But you know, there's just you know, part of America is about thinking big, right? It's one of these things where you know some some kid from the wrong side of the tracks can walk into Google and say like, oh my goodness, like maybe you know this there's something here for me to learn. And so I, I would say it's important for people just to continue having that optimism and to really think big and to sort of say, like, the opportunity is there. I just, you know, you know, some places might be harder to get for the time being, but, you know, it's still there. And, you know, hopefully with some of the companies that we're working with or the companies that, you know, I'm, you know that, that, that wind up popping out of some of the challenges that, you know, the pandemic has created, like, you know, they can create new jobs and new opportunities for people that, you know, otherwise weren't, you know, possible before. So I agree. I think big, figure out how to, how to join and help the, these mission-driven companies that are, that are growing fast. Is there anything I didn't ask you about today that we should, that you want to you tell us? Uh, you know, I think... Uh, there's there's so much hope uh, once we get past this this craziness with this pandemic. You know, I think everybody's roaring um, to get back to some level of normalcy. Uh, that you know these 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 things that we never thought were possible, or that we sort of sat there and go, well, you know, there's so many barriers in the way. We'll just sort of fall off, and you'll see these fantastic new opportunities sort of pop up that uh, you know no one ever envisioned. So you know, it's one of the things I look forward to figuring out what that is, and you know, working with great founders to to make possible. Awesome, Wes. Well, you've, you've helped so many amazing founders. Excited to see what you're going to do next. I really appreciate you joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode of American Optimists. These are the people who give me hope and optimism for the future of our country.